Hi everybody and welcome back. Today we are going to do the final installment in our plant diversity series. We're going to look at angiosperms and these are the final piece in our puzzle. It is the last step of our plant evolution. These are the most developed of all of our plants and we are going to look at some of their specific details, what makes them so unique from the other groups. Please also remember that in this video, I'm going to recap alternation of generations. So if you need to, you can skip over that part of the video if you've watched the others, and you can go straight into the life cycle of angiosperms. So let's look at some defining characteristics of angiosperms. So they really are well-developed vascular plants, which means that they're great for terrestrial life. They've got really good um, xylem and phloem, just like their cousins, gymnosperms, except um, gymnosperms are a little bit more limited to where they can live. They often live in very high altitudes. There needs to be a lot of water um, because they grow so big, whereas angiosperms pretty much can live anywhere, and the majority of the plant life on Earth is an angiosperm. Um, they do have a cuticle, which is really important to prevent drying out, and that also allows them to live in lots of different um, climates and locations. And what makes angiosperms angiosperms is they are flowering plants. And these flowers are there to attract pollinators. And they do it in a multitude of ways. Flowers can attract pollinators through scent. So they smell sweet. Perhaps they have sweet tasting nectar. They're brightly colored. Um, uh, they might look like a certain object that might attract um, a pollinator towards it because the pollinator wants to get food from it or it looks like something else. And it's an ingenious way that um, plants have evolved to attract insects, um, birds, um, mice even, um, to be pollinators and to help spread the pollen around. The final thing that's unique to angiosperms is that their seeds are found in fruit. And this is also a great delivery mechanism for seeds. A animal will come along, it will eat the fruit. Um, it will swallow the seeds and then it will defecate the seeds somewhere else, uh, dropping them a little way away. And that then allows that angiosperm to grow somewhere else. And now, yet again, we're going to look at the alternation of generations. So this is when you are going to move from a diploid sporophyte to a haploid gametophyte. Now, in angiosperms, this is quite difficult to see um, because they're not two separate plants or two separate structures like they are in moss and ferns. And so in gymnosperms and angiosperms, it's a little harder to see. But luckily, if you understand um, either one of these, the gymno or the angiosperm, it's very easy to use the explanation for either of these plant groups. And so to clarify, we have got our male and our female cycles. We have the male on the left and the female on the right. And so if we start off with our uh, diploid sporophyte, um, inside of our diploid sporophyte, there are microsporangium in the male and there are microsporophytes inside of there. And if they undergo the process of meiosis, which is when you are taking a chromosomal number and you half it, that means if we started off with 12 chromosomes, it will move into having a haploid number, which means that it will have six chromosomes. And that's because we need to have fertilization. Now, once we've produced our haploid spores, they are going to grow a little bit bigger, they're gonna get more mature, and they are going to produce a sperm cell. On the female part of our diagram, we are going to start with the megasporangium, which is a structure. Inside of that megasporangium, we are going to have some megasporocytes. They are also going to undergo meiosis, and they are going to produce a megaspore. That megaspore, yet again, undergoes more development, and it is going to become an egg. And that's where we find our gametophyte generations. And so this dividing line that sits between the two separates our two generations. We've got our sporophytes at the bottom here, and we've got our gametophytes growing at the top. Remember, in angiosperms, it's quite difficult to tell the difference between these two just by looking at a plant. Um, when you are looking at a flowering plant and you're looking at the flowers and the leaves, you are looking at the sporophyte generation. When you are looking at the pollen and you are looking at the ovules, which you would have to actually tear the flower open to find these things, 
you would be able to eventually find the gametophytes. But they're quite small and they're quite difficult to see compared to what we would find in um, moss and ferns, where those are very, very big structures that you would be able to tell the difference between the two. So let's begin the life cycle of our angiosperm. And I'm going to zoom in on our starting point, which is here, the mature sporophyte or our mature flower. And they've made a cross section through it so we can see on the inside. And we've actually got both male and female parts inside of this flower. Some angiosperms have separate male flowers and separate female flowers, or they have completely separate plants. For example, avocados have a separate uh, male avocado tree to a separate female avocado tree. Now, if we were to look um, inside of our flower, we've got our male and our female parts. I'm going to start with the male because it's a little bit easier. So if we go into the male structure, which are these little uh, um, anthers at the very end here, if we zoom in on it, that is our microsporangium. That's what we mentioned earlier. And sitting inside of there, can you see all those little circular structures? Those are all of our microsporocytes. They are going to undergo meiosis, which remember is halving their genetic number, and they are going to make microspores. They're going to develop, they're going to grow a, a coat on the outside, and we're going to make a pollen grain. And so now we're going to pause on the male structure, and now this is ready to go. This is ready for fertilization. Now let's pause on the um, male structures, and let's move a little bit back to the female. So the female um, components of the flower are located a little bit further down, in the ovary, which is this whole swollen region that sits down in the bottom here. If we zoom in on it, there it is. And each one of these individual little structures inside of the ovary are ovules. Now, each one of these has the potential to become a seed. And now if you're visualizing it, you can now imagine that this would be the flesh of a fruit that you would eat. And then these are the seeds that sit inside of it, like a tomato perhaps. Now, these little ovules are where we found our megasporangium. And that megasporangium undergoes meiosis and it is going to produce our megaspore. Now, our megaspore, remember, is haploid and it is going to wait to be um, fertilized. So, how do we actually fertilize our um, egg cell? Well, um, it's a little bit um, more detail um, than our gymnosperms, but essentially this is how it works. There's a little bit of overlap. So what happens is, if we want to fertilize our egg cell, a, um, a pollen grain, which is one of these over here, is going to be um, pollinated by an insect or a bird, and pollen is going to be taken from one flower to the next. And some pollen is going to get stuck on the stigma. Now, the stigma is the part of the female flower. If I were to zoom out on this picture a little bit and go back to our original photo at the top here, this over here is the stigma. And you'll see that if we follow it down, it's attached to the ovary at the bottom. And so that's where we want the pollen to go. We want it to go from the anther and we want it to get stuck over here on our stigma. Now, once that's got stuck, I'm just going to zoom back in again, the stigma um, uh, holds on to, and it's quite sticky, it's going to hold on to our pollen and our pollen is going to grow a pollen tube. And you'll remember that I spoke about a pollen tube earlier in the gymnosperm video. And basically, a pollen tube is a tube that allows the sperm cell to swim down and get down to our waiting ovule. Now, as that then swims all the way down, we go further and deeper into our, um, our ovary. So let's track the pathway. Here's our pollen tube. It goes down round, and then it goes into our ovule. So now what does that look like if we were to look inside of it? So we're going to swing over here. So if we've zoomed in on just one of our ovules, here is the pollen tube coming alongside, and you will notice that there are actually two cells over here. There are two sperm cells, and I'm going to explain why soon. Now, if you look on the inside of the female um, ovule, which is this whole structure over here, We've got a whole bunch of cells on the inside here. 
And um, we refer to this as the embryo sac. The embryo sac is technically also the gametophyte. The pollen grains, we mustn't forget, are the male gametophyte in this example. And so now we've got our egg cells waiting. Over here, they're haploid. They were produced by our um, gametophyte. They're made inside of there by our megaspores. And our uh, eggs are waiting to be fertilized by our sperm cells. But this is where it gets a little bit interesting and it's a little bit different from the others that we've done before. When fertilization happens, it actually happens twice. And so what happens is when the pollen tube attaches, and you can see here as the pollen tube is now physically attached, our egg nucleus is going to fuse with one of our sperm cells. So our sperm cells are discharged and they make their way into the inside of the ovule. And one of our sperm cells is going to fuse with our egg cell and make a zygote. So that means I'm going to take N plus N, so sperm cell plus egg cell, and I'm going to make a 2N structure or a zygote. That zygote will become the seed, the future baby plant. The second sperm cell is going to fuse with what we call a central cell. A central cell is basically a cell that hasn't gone undergone meiosis. Its main purpose is actually to be fertilized to make food. And that exactly is what happens with the endosperm. And so what happens is our central cell, which is 2N, plus one of these extra sperm cells that made their way down, makes... 3N, which is triploid. And now the endosperm's main function is to produce food. And it makes a very um, nutrient-rich matrix that sits around the zygote so that when eventually the seed is completely finished developing, if we move over, we can now see what everything is used for. So we've got the seed coat on the outside, which was originally the wall of the ovule where we started. We have the food supply, which is the endosperm. That is the endosperm. And then we have the embryo, which is our future baby plant. You put all of those three things together and you make a seed. Now let's say an organism comes along, it eats the seeds, it eats the fruit that has the seeds inside of it. Those seeds get dispersed and uh, those seeds land and they start to germinate and they will grow into a future mature sporophyte and we start the whole process all over again. Now, for some clarity, what I'm going to do is I have a little further explanation on double pollination, which is what I explain now where we have um, one pollen grain with two sperm cells in it. So I really like this diagram because it's going to help us just quickly unpack that whole double pollination thing one more time because I know it can be quite confusing. And so remember, we've got some basic structures here. We have the ovary, which will eventually become the fruit. And sitting inside the fruit, we have our ovules. There's one of them. We have the style, which is just this long tube. It's hollow on the inside. And sitting right at the end of it is the stigma. And this is all the female part of the flower. And the stigma is sticky. And what are we waiting for is a pollen grain to come along. And so what happens is the pollen grain adheres to our stigma. And inside of the pollen grain, there is something called a generative cell and a tube cell. Now, the tube cell, no guesses here, is going to grow into the pollen tube. The generative cell is what is going to produce our two sperm cells. And so what we see here in the second diagram is our two sperm cells making their way down the pollen tube. And so it says our generative cell travels down inside the pollen tube and it divides to form two main sperm cells. Now, we're going to need those two sperm cells because those two sperm cells are going to make it nice and easy for us to be able to, one, pollinate and fertilize our egg cell. But also we need the other one because we need to make an endosperm. So once the pollen tube penetrates an opening in the ovule, we can call it a microfile. It's not a really important name for us to remember, so don't focus too much on it. And so now what you have is the egg combining with our sperm cells. So what they've done is we've zoomed in here even further, and now we've got our two sperm nuclei. 
we have got one sperm cell inside of the egg. Okay, so there's one inside of the egg. And we've got another sperm cell inside of a separate cell, which we, in the previous um, post, I called it a central cell. And it says one of the sperm fertilizes the egg to form a diploid zygote, while the other sperm fertilizes two polar nuclei, or you can call them central cells, that's what we can call them, to form the endosperm, which will become food for a growing embryo. Now, don't be too concerned with the names like polar nuclei. nuclei. It's a little bit difficult to find diagrams without all of these unnecessary labels on them. But essentially, all I need you to know is that one sperm cell um, fertilizes the egg. The other sperm cell fertilizes what we call a central cell. And that um, combination of the central cell and the sperm cell makes the endosperm. So let's finish this lesson off with a terminology recap. So we spent the beginning of the lesson looking at things that um, make angiosperms unique, and that is that they have seeds, and these seeds are often inside of fruits. Very, very de um, defining quality is that they have flowers, which are sweet smelling, brightly colored. It needs to attract a pollinator, and angiosperms are pollinated by insects and birds. Um, there is the sporophyte generation, which is the dominant generation in angiosperms. It's basically when you look at an angiosperm and you look at a flowering plant, that is the sporophyte generation. The gametophyte generation is a little bit more trickier to see. Remember, the male gametophyte is our pollen grain. And the female gametophyte, which is really tough to see, is actually inside of the ovule. So we won't actually be able to see these unless you pull apart a flower. Now we looked at pollen. And so pollen is the packaged sperm cell. It's basically when we have gone through meiosis, we have made our microspore, and now we've put a nice coat on the outside of it to protect it, and that's our pollen grain. That pollen grain will grow into our gametophyte, our male gametophyte. Then in our female structures, we have the ovary. The ovary is, will turn into our fruit. And inside of the ovary, we have our ovules. Each one of these ovules has the potential to become a seed. And sitting inside each of the ovules is an egg waiting to be pollinated. So a pollen grain comes along and grows a pollen tube down the stigma via the style. And inside of it, there is a generative cell. That generative cell is going to make two sperm cell nuclei. And one of them is going to fuse with the egg to make a zygote. The other one is going to fuse with a central cell. And the central cell is 2N. Remember, that is diploid. And the sperm cell is N, which is haploid. And they form the endosperm. When the endosperm is essentially a um, nutritive layer that the seed will use in order to grow. I hope this lesson has been useful to you and I will see you all again soon. Bye.